so let's get started today. I've uh, got two things on tap. One is to go over extendable hashing. Second thing is to review for the exam on Tuesday. So I will start out by doing about half an hour on extendable hashing and then about 45 minutes on the midterm. I'll take questions on the midterm when we start <coughs> reviewing for it. Um, so if you recall from last time when we were looking at the um, B plus trees, they have a nice characteristic that they have an improvement over uh, binary search trees in that their performance is log ceiling of m divided by 2 n levels. And that's equal to the number of discretes you need to make. And I also said, well, can we do better? Can we make m so large that we essentially can create a constant for log m divided by 2n? And the answer is yes, using a variation on hashing. So remember, with hashing, what you do is you have an array. And you compute a uh, hash key. You use that hash key to index into the array. So extendable hashing has a similar idea. It has a, at the top level, it has an array as well. Now this array is stored on disk rather than in memory because that top level can get so big. And what the array is based on is the leading number of bits in the hash key. So just like with hashing, you apply a hash function to get a um, random number. Then you take some number of bits from that random number, leading bits. So in this case, we're taking the two leading bits from the random number. And depending on what those two bits, their index is, then the record goes into that bucket. So for example, every record that hashes to two zeros will go into the first bucket. Any uh, record that hashes to two ones in the leading bits goes into the last bucket. So that works well until the bucket overflows. So unlike in, so essentially what we're using is separate chaining, an idea like separate chaining where you keep adding things to the bucket. Now with separate chaining, the list could get arbitrarily long. We can't do that with secondary storage because eventually the leaf or the block overflows. You can only store so many records in a block. At some point the block fills up. When that happens, we have to split the block. So we actually will refer to these as leaves, but each leaf is stored on a block. Okay. So right here, we have essentially limited ourselves to, with this scheme, two uh, secondary storage accesses, one to the top level array, and then one to the bucket pointed to by that array. And the requirement is you have to store that top level array contiguously on disk so that you can calculate knowing if you know the beginning address. So if you have, if you know, I'm just going to now use a very simplified thing. Let's say we know that the beginning physical address is 1000. And we know that we can fit, say, um, one, let's say we can fit 100 um, entries per block, and that our entry that we compute is 342. So in effect, this is block 1, this is block 2, this is block 2. So 342 it's going to fall into block 3 because block 0 has 0 to 99 entries 
This is 100 to 199. This is 200 to 299. So 300 to 399. So as long as we can compute the physical address, which is pretty easy, there's 100 blocks, so we know it goes into block 3. And if, for example, the blocks are 4,096 bytes, then the address would have to be 4,096 times 3 plus 1,000. So you could compute the physical address very quickly as long as that top level directory is stored contiguously on the disk. Then you retrieve the appropriate um, block, and then once you have that block, that will give you your address to the appropriate leaf. So that's only two uh, disk accesses to get to your record. So that's really good. Now, can we actually make that work? And the question is, what happens when we have to split a block? Okay, so let's go over here and take a look at that. So we have something like, it's a little easier for me to read. Eh, that's horrible. Got to do better with my drawing. Okay, so we start. And initially it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, which is really 0, 1, 2, 3. If you translate those to the appropriate things. Okay, so assume, yeah, we need bigger. put the keys in first and I'll have know how big I need it. I'm just going to use 4-bit keys for the time being. Some of them may duplicate because remember this is um, leading bits. Maybe that's the only one we have was 0, 1. Okay, and so the first thing you should notice that's different is you don't have to have the leaf's more than half empty. They may be more than half empty. Okay, so we can't put any, we relax the restriction that the leaves have to be more than half empty. So the leaves can be more than half empty. Okay, so let's say we can store at most four records per leaf. And we want to add another record to this one. So let's say we want to add uh, a record 0, 0. Uh, we'll make it 1, 0. So it would go into this leaf, but we're saying that leaf is full. So what we do is we split the leaf and we add one additional bit to the bits we're considering. So now, for this leaf, we'll consider 0, 0, 1 and 0, 0, 0. So we'll split it, and the only one that's actually going to move is 0, 0. Whoops, I sure don't want that. Okay, so the 0, 0, 0, 1 is going to move out. So I'll get that out of there. And it's going to move off into its own one. So
be 0, 0, 0, 0. This 0, 0, 1 is going to come in because it has 0, 0, 1 is the leading one. And all the other ones were still 0, 0, 1s. So the 0, 0, 0, 0 moved out. And we have to do something about this directory because we're now considering three bits. So what we're going to do is double the size of the directory so that it now considers three bits rather than two bits. Okay, so we're going to double the size of the directory. So zero 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 one zero one zero zero one one hundred one oh one one ten one eleven effectively zero one two all the way up to seven. Okay, so zero 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 points to there, zero zero one points to here. Now for the remaining ones they still are only using the leading two bits. So 0, 1, 0 still points to this one, and 0, 1, 1 still points to this leaf because both the 0, 1, 0 and the 0, 1, 1 entries still go to it. Same thing for the 1, 0, 0, and the 101, they both go here. 110 and 111 both go here. So when we doubled the size of the directory, it only mattered for the leaf that split. So they're now using three bits. The other three leaves are still only using two bits. Okay, so in the book, they distinguished between the number of bits being used in the directory, it was using three leading bits, and the bits being used in each uh, leaf. So in this one, it was using three. This one was using three leading bits. This leaf was using two, this was using two, and this was using two. Okay, so, just a so the way we keep the way we handle insertions is if the leaf isn't full, we just put a record there. That's fine. Nothing else has to be done. If the leaf is full, we split it and move. we add one additional um, bit to our leading bits. And all the ones that have a zero move off to one leaf. All the ones that continue to have a one in that extra bit stay in the leaf. And if necessary, we double the size of the directory. Okay, just, I'll get to you in a moment. So the other thing is, what happens if we split one of these next? Let's say we add a couple more records to this last one. So let's say we add 1100, and now we want to add 1101 to it. It would fill up. So we would split it, and again, we would start to consider the first three bits rather than the first two bits. So 1100 and 1100 would all move off. So we'd have a new, actually, the ones need to move this time. So 1111 moves, 1110 moves off to a new block. And in this block, we no longer have the 111 or the 1110, but we can add this 1101 now. Whoops. So we can get 1101. But now we update this entry, this 111, 
it no longer points to the same bucket. The 111 is now pointing off to the new bucket. And they both are now updated to say that they're using three bits rather than two bits. So if there's if the number of bits you're using in the leaf is less than the number of bits in the directory, you split the leaf, but you don't have to do anything with the directory other than update one of the entries in the directory or potentially a couple entries so it points to the new leaf. Okay? Yes. It's dependent on their leading bits. So here, all the we went from two bits to considering the first three leading bits. So everything that started with one one. So it used to be we only considered the first two bits, which were one one. Okay. When it splits, we now consider the third leading bit, which is going to be either a zero or a one. So everything that is one one zero stays in the old leaf. So just, I'm, I'm just like this. Can you have this as well the one one zero? Yes, it doesn't matter. So if I moved them to the new leaf, then I would have updated the one one zero entry. So yeah, it doesn't matter which you move. You just have to make sure you update that entry in the directory so it points to the new leaf. Yeah, it doesn't matter which way you do it. Okay, So really it's a very simple scheme and it guarantees two disk accesses. Now, this only works for two disk accesses if it is the main index for the relation, that is that the records are being stored in these leaves. Typically, extendable hashing is used with secondary indices. So what is going into these leaves is actually still just keys. And the keys are then pointing off to the actual records. So if extendable hashing is storing the file itself, which is very rare, so if extendable hashing stores the file, Okay, each record requires two disk accesses. Exactly. So, or I should say no more. Requires no more. The reason I say no more then is because you can always cache some blocks. So maybe a block's already in memory. Okay, if that's pretty rare, Normally, extendable hashing is used as a secondary index. So if extendable hashing is, a sec is used for a secondary index, OK, um, a record requires no more than three accesses. Okay, and then, as I said, the so-called leaves are actually still just storing the index values, and then they point off to a leaf, presumably, in a B plus trait. So they're not storing the record, they're still storing just a index value and then that index value is pointing off to the record in the B plus trait. So that's why it requires a third disk access because now you have to go off to the B plus trait to actually retrieve it. So this is really nice and 
the question then that you should be asking is can this, okay, there's a couple issues. First of all, this actually doesn't happen that much because the leaves are so big, but if you go from, say, two to three bits, and if every entry in the leaf on that third bit, it was a one, it wouldn't have done me any good. All of the keys would have stayed in that leaf. So occasionally, you might have to not just expand it by one leading bit, you might have to go to another leading bit. That's very rare because in real life, there'd probably be 500 keys in a uh, leaf, and it'd be almost impossible with random keys to have 500 all having the same leading three bits. So that'd be pretty uncommon. However, a more problematic thing is what if you have a lot of keys that are agreeing on the first few bits, this directory could keep doubling in size. Let's say that, as you noticed, this leaf stayed pretty full after I had to split it. And in fact, the addition of one more key with 001 would force me to double the size of the directory again to 16. So the problem with keeping my branching factor very high is that the directory, the size of the directory is how big M is. That's the number of children I have. So the problem is this directory could get huge because every time I double it, the size of the directory is, so the size of the directory, D is the leading number of bits. So the size of the directory, okay, size of directory, equals 2 to the d, and that's equal to the number of children. So the problem is, for those of you who are familiar with exponential growth, this directory could get exponentially large. So it's, the scheme is only going to work in practice if the directory does not get exponentially large. Okay? It turns out, in practice, it does not. So in practice, and actually, if you have a good random number generator that's pretty good at randomizing, then it can be shown through some pretty complicated math that the size of the directory is n, I'll write it down, is order n to the 1 plus 1 over m. One plus one over m and what's the final factor divided by m. Okay, where m in this case is number of uh, keys per block. So if m is pretty large, like 500, that's actually pretty close to n is pretty close to order n divided by m. So, in fact, the directory really doesn't get to be that enormous as long as m is pretty big. If m is small, like 4, then it could certainly start to grow at least somewhat rapidly. But if m is quite large, then it grows very slowly. So that's a great result. It means we can have our cake and eat it, too. Okay. And it turns out that if you look at the number of leaves, so the number of children, so that's the size, the number of children, okay, so this is um, average directory size.
And the average number of children is roughly n divided by m times log 2 of e. So n is the number of records. And again, m is the number of keys per block. Okay, so log 2e is, I think, about 1.44. So it's about 1.44. So the minimum, if every block was full, you would have to have n divided by m blocks. So the log 2e is the number of additional um, blocks you need because not every entry is going to be full. In fact, you don't even have to have them be half full. Okay. What that implies is that on average the percent empty is log 2 of e, 1 over log 2 of e, it's about 0.69. It turns out that everyone is about 0.69 full on average. Okay, you get that by effectively, so if you have 1.44 times the minimum number, 1 divided by 1.44, or 0.69, is going to give you roughly how full each leaf is. As it turns out, that number, 0.69, turns out to be the average um, fullness of a B-plus tree node as well. It's interesting. They're both about 0.69. So even though we're not requiring any leaf in the extendable hash table to be even half full, it turns out that on average they're still almost 70% full. And that's because you presume you have a good randomization algorithm for randomizing the uh, keys. And the reason it turns out to be 0.69 full for both B plus trees and for extendable hashing is that in some sense, an extendable hash table is a B plus tree with M made arbitrarily large. Okay? So it's splitting at the same point that a B plus tree splits when the leaf becomes full. And because you're randomizing everything, it's very rare that you would actually have a leaf that is not more than half full. So, very cute, clever algorithm. I don't think it's particularly difficult to understand, but if you have questions, you should feel free to ask. We're not going to worry about deletions. Actually, deletions are very easy because you simply delete, and because you don't have to keep them half full, then, and I believe most implementations, even if you got to an empty bucket, they wouldn't bother to merge. There's just no real reason to. So deletion would just tend to be remove the key from the bucket. Okay? So essentially, extendable hashing is a cool, um, almost like merging or symbiosis between hashing on the one side and B plus trees on the other side, guaranteeing that we only have, at most, two accesses when the extendable hash tree is the physical organization for the file and no more than three disk accesses when it is the secondary index. That's why we use extendable hashing for secondary indices. Very simple, super simple to implement, unlike B plus trees, and no more than three disk accesses. And the directories just don't blow up. as I just showed you the direct as long as M is big, which it always is, because or almost always is, because you can almost fit a whole bunch of keys into one block, then this n to the one plus one divided by m is going to grow almost linearly. Okay. Perfect. Half an hour. Just as I promised. 31 minutes. Okay, so the exam.
First of all, I have review notes. So if you click through the review notes, you see everything you have to cover, which can kind of be, it's a lot. But we did cover a fair amount of material. And a lot of these are terms. And remember, I'm not asking you to regurgitate this stuff from memory. I'm asking you just to be able to recognize it on an exam, because most of this is multiple choice or multiple answer. So uh, for example, I'm saying that you need to be familiar with the advantages and disadvantages of database management systems. Well, that just means if I ask you on the test a multiple answer question, I say, which of the following are advantages of um, database management systems? You just have to be able to recognize them. It's not, I'm not asking you an essay question where I say, list for me the four advantages of database management systems. Okay. So from the introduction, and again, most of the exam is multiple choice, multiple answers. The uh, undergraduate students in CS465 need to know how to write SQL queries because there will be a couple queries, and I promise there's one involving a join that you will need to write. The graduate students also have to know how to write relational algebra and relational calculus queries for the exam. So yes, Tom. Definitely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And usually I tell you how many correct there are because um, it stops you from trying to answer every one because what I usually do is deduct points if you make too many answers. So usually I'll tell you how many correct answers there are so you don't go circling everything. Okay. So there's a B-plus tree problem. You'll have to work that by hand. And there's queries. You'll have to do those by hand. So everything else is multiple choice or multiple answer. OK? But they, well, we'll get to it. So from chapter one, you just need to know the advantages and disadvantages of database management systems and that the functions provided by a database management system is they provide a data definition language that allows a database administrator to specify the structure of the database, so declare the relations, their attributes, their types. The data manipulation language, which allows you to do the so-called CRUD operations, create, read, update, delete. And access control, so who has access to what information in the database. So People like customers will have different access privileges than staff. Maybe management has uh, different access privileges than staff members. Then from chapter one, we skip to chapter four. We essentially skip chapters two and three, which you're not responsible for. Chapter four gives the theoretical <laughs> basis for the DDL in the relational databases. So. The relational model that is discussed in chapter four is a theoretical basis for uh, the data definition language that is used with relational databases. And you need to know the correspondence between these terms. So relation table, I'm sorry, relation tuple attribute is something that professors like me use. Table row column is what professional programmers use and customers. File, record, and field is what database administrators use because they're thinking at that point about the physical layout of the relations. But relation, table, and file all mean the same thing. Tuple, row, record all mean the same thing. So you need to know the correspondence. Then these two terms, degree is the number of attributes. So it's the horizontal width of the relation. Cardinality is the vertical, the number of tuples in the relation. Then we gave a bunch of properties of a relation, which I'm not going to regurgitate here, but they were things like only one attribute value per cell, or the order of the attributes is immaterial, or every um, column 
can have only one domain type. So those were different properties of a relation, so you should review that. Then we talked about the different kinds of keys you could have. So a super key is any key that uniquely identifies tuples in a relation, whereas a candidate key is the minimum number of attributes for that super key required to identify a alt tuple. So for example, if whoops, if the super key, a super key might be the attributes A, B, C, and D, but if only attributes B and C are required to uniquely identify all the tuples in the relation, then we call A, B, C, D a super key, but B, C would be the candidate key. So the candidate key is a slimmed down version of the super key. It's the minimum number of attributes we need from the super key in order to uniquely identify any tuple in the relation. Then the primary key, from the candidate keys, we choose a primary key. So the primary key is the one we choose to um, organize the file or relation on. Alternate keys are any candidate keys not chosen to be the primary key. And foreign keys are primary keys in other relations. That is, they're a key in a relation that essentially points to a primary key in another relation. We use them for joins. So for example, in the staff relation, there was a manager. That was a foreign key. There was also a branch number. That was another foreign key. Okay, so these are essentially keys pointing into another relation that allow us to perform joins, connect relations together. And then we talked about integrity constraints. So we had the fact that null is simply a value that's currently unknown. Does anyone remember what entity integrity is? Yes, what? Not foreign keys, that's referential integrity. <clears throat> entity integrity is primary keys. Okay? So entity, it means that, so the way to think of it, entity is the um, boss. Okay? So it's simply saying primary keys can't be null because if they're null, they can't uniquely identify a tuple. Referential integrity, remember a foreign key points to something, so referential integrity means it must point to something. So referential integrity says either a foreign key points to a primary key in a, another relation or all of its uh, attributes are null. So you can't have a foreign key where some subset of the, its attributes are null. Either if it does point to a primary key, that primary key must exist in another relation. You can't have a so-called dangling pointer. Okay, so referential integrity says the foreign key either points to an existing primary key in another relation or all of the fields of the foreign key are null. Bentley. Okay. And then general constraints are what we call business constraints. So there are things like no realtor can manage more than 100 properties, or no realtor can make more than $50,000, or um, no customer can, currently have, can rent more than 25 videos at a time. Okay, so those are our business constraints. And finally, so remember, we're still talking about the different things that a database administrator specifies or is constrained by. The database administrator can create views. So those are virtual tables that are formed from the so-called base tables. So the base tables are the ones that are actually physically stored on the file system. Views are virtual relations that are 
derived from the base relations, and they may or may not exist. So remember we talked about view materialization where you are able to cache a view. So if we go to the slides on views, very end, okay, we had There we go. So we could have view materialization where we cache the view. So then it exists, but we have to then update it every time the underlying base relations are updated. So you need to be familiar with the fact that we actually could cache a view using view materialization. The advantage is now we can access the tuples quickly because we don't have to read, um, create it from scratch every time by querying the base relations, but the disadvantage is there's some cost to keeping it up to date. Okay, and then we talked about the advantages and disadvantages of <coughs> views, and you need to th know those. I, I don't have time to go through all the advantages and disadvantages, but you can look them up. Okay, and then there were some restrictions on updating views. So you might want to update a view by adding a tuple to the view and having the underlying base relations updated. But there were some issues like if a view was based on an aggregate operation, like if we had a view that was counting the number of staff in each branch, we can't just update the number of staff in a branch because that view is drawn from the underlying staff relation and in order to update the underlying staff relation we'd have to have information on the staff member we just added, like their name, their staff ID. We wouldn't have that information if we just added one to the count for say branch B5. So there's restrictions on when you're allowed to update views that you should be aware of. So then we had gone and kind of looked at the theoretical foundation for the relational uh, model for its DDL. And then we went to SQL, which is the data manipulation language used for the most common type of database or relational database, which is SQL, which currently is produced by Oracle. And the basic fundamental operations in SQL are select, project, join. Select um, is selecting tuples. Project is selecting attributes. So that's, again, horizontal. Select is vertical. Join is joining two different relations together. So again, you need to know how to write those various relations. One thing I will point out, null values. When you are trying to retrieve tuples involving null values, when you say, you can't say something like, you can't say where, uh, say comment equal null. What do you have to do if you want no comments? Nope, that's not quite it. Is. You say where comment is null. But thank you, because that will probably be an answer on the multiple choice exam now. So it's where comment is null. So just remember that null is a special, special case. Then null the aggregate operations. There's five of them, min, max, average, uh, count, and what was it? Min, max, average, count, 
Some, thank you. Some. So there's five of them. And average and sum work only with numbers. The remaining uh, three work also with uh, strings. So you can do min, max, and count on anything, but you can only do sum and average with numbers. Okay? Then sometimes you want to be able to perform aggregate operations on groups of tuples, like you might want to count all the staff in the branch relation, or you might want to count all the properties that each staff manages. So to do that, you will do a group by clause, and you can use a, just like where is used to filter tuples, having is used to filter groups. So for example, I might want only all branches whose staff count exceeds 100. So after I aggregate all the branches by staff and count them, I would only then want to print out the branches with more than 100 staff. So where is used with individual tuples, having is used with aggregate operations to filter um, groups. Okay, order by is the keyword for sorting results, not group by. If you put group by on your exam, you'll lose at least one point. Depends on what kind of mood I'm in, but probably just one point. Then there are a number of types of joins, theta being the most general. So remember with a theta join, it can involve any kind of relational operation. It can be less than, greater than, not equal. But the only kind we care about in practice is equijoins, which use equality between attributes. And Generally, we are using natural joints. Does anyone remember what a natural join is? Does that is what? Just the it's off the column names, the common column names. So it's an equijoin between all the common columns, column names in the two relations. So that's the most common kind of join that we uh, use, but. Sometimes the column names don't match. Like in the staff uh, relation, the manager is a is named is a foreign key that's a staff number, but we can't call it staff number because a staff member already has a staff number. In that case, we'd have to use an equijoin. Okay, then kind of along a vertical axis, these are all possible joins. Again. We typically only care about the equijoins. So a semi-join is where, while we do a natural join or an equijoin on properties between two relations, in the result, we only care about the left relation. So for example, we might want all students that are taking CS1465 this semester. So we do a join between students and courses, but all we care about is students. So that's a semi-join, because in the end, all we care about is one of the two relations. An inner join is what we do by default. It only includes the tuples where there is a matching tuple from each of the two relations. So a we only include, a, if we have two I'm just going to use red. So if we have two relations, R and S, and we have a tuple in R, and we're using attribute A, and it has a value of 10, the only way that tuple appears in the result is if there's a corresponding, let's say we're doing the equijoin with attribute B and S, the only way that it appears in the final result is if A has a corresponding attribute in S, or I'm sorry, there's a corresponding tuple in S whose value is also 10. So that's an inner join, it's by default, but sometimes we want tuples from one or the other relation to be in the result, even if they don't match any tuples in the other relation. So if we do, and we call that an outer join. So a left outer join says include all tuples from R in the final result, even if some tuple doesn't match. So let's say R has an attribute with value 20, 
and there's no corresponding tuple in S with a value of 20, this tuple would still appear in the result in a left outer join. All the fields that we have for S would be filled with nulls to indicate there is no corresponding match in S. A right outer join says include all tuples from S, even if they don't match a tuple from the left one. The full outer join says include all tuples from both relations in the final result. So questions about that? Okay. So moving on, you need to know. I can tell you that you won't be asked to write insert, update, or delete, but you may be required to answer a multiple choice or multiple answer involving these. Same thing with subqueries. I won't expect you to write one. I expect you to be able to interpret one for me if I give it to you. Or if I give you, if I ask for, I might say, I want to find all students who have taken CS465, and I might say, circle all of the following queries that will um, fulfill this request. And one of them could involve a subquery. You should be able to answer that kind of multiple answer question as well. Okay? So be familiar with the different kinds of subqueries. Okay? And there were three. Scalars, those just return a single value. Row, which can return effectively a table and is only used with an exist predicate. So that can be used for set division. And table, which you use within, it returns only a single column and you would use it with the in operator. So it returns essentially a set and you're saying select all things where this attribute value is in the set returned by the subquery. Okay, and table ones are typically used when you don't know how to write a join. But I expect you to write join. So on your when I actually ask you to write a query, you will have to write it using a join. I will not let you write it using a subquery. Okay. Then, just a few things with SQL's particular data definition language. There are a few data types that are not in typical programming languages, although you might find them in a scripting language these days. So dates are important in databases, so you find date, time, timestamp, interval. Interval being the time between two times or two dates. And precise real numbers because businesses care about precise storing of monetary values. We don't want to have people siphoning off fractions of a cent because they add up to real money. So those are the two big differences between the data types in SQL and the data types in a regular programming language. So I expect you to know the syntax for creating tables and how you would specify things like entity integrity. You say not null. Referential integrity, that's where you say foreign key references and being able to write general constraints, which are simply queries where you basically say usually either exists or not exists. So you, for example, might say not exists and then write a query to return all realtors who manage more than 100 properties. Okay. So then also how to create views using SQL. So here's our view maintenance stuff that you can either create the views from scratch each time using view resolution or you can cache it. Either way works. And here I was kind. I actually had the different conditions that are imposed on a view if you want to be able to update it. 
Okay, so from there, we moved back to the theory. And in chapter four, we talked about the formal basis for the data definition language. Chapter five was talking about the formal basis for the data manipulation language. And the relational calculus is the formal basis for the data manipulation language. It is the language that SQL is derived from. And it is a declarative, non-procedural language. Now, I believe what happened is that in order to write the query optimizers, they researchers needed a way to, they needed a procedural language. So the relational calculus wasn't a particularly good way to write query optimizers. So they needed a language to speak about an implementation language. So they developed the relational algebra which is a high-level procedural language for specifying queries and is more suited for implementing a query optimizer. So essentially, what in theory happens is a user specifies the query in the relational calculus. The query optimizer converts that relational calculus query to a relational algebra query that is then able to optimize. Okay. So the relational algebra is not the formal basis for the DML. It is the relational calculus. Okay, so when we you hear the word relationally complete used, it means that we have a, di a direct manipulation language like the relational algebra or SQL or MySQL that is that for every uh, query that can be specified using the relational calculus, it can implement that query. That, so a DML is relationally complete if it can implement every query that can be specified in the relational calculus. So both the relational algebra and SQL are relationally complete. Okay, so we talked about the relational algebra first because it's a little more familiar to you all. There's five fundamental operations and three syntactic sugar operations. And while join is a fundamental operation to SQL, it is not fundamental to the relational algebra. Select and project are, so is the Cartesian product and union and set difference, but join can be derived from what two relational algebra operations? What two relational algebra operations can be used to derive a join? That would actually not be correct. It's a good guess, but it's not correct. Cartesian product, because Cartesian product takes two relations, jams them together, takes all um, permutations or all combinations of their tuples. So. Cartesian product is one because it jams them together. How do you get an equijoin? Okay, it's not set difference because set difference is where you take whatever is in A but not in B. In effect, a join is I have to take whatever is in both is Whatever is match it, whatever matches B in A. So it's actually a little bit more like set intersection. The other operation is selection. So once you have the Cartesian product, you select all tuples that match on certain column names. So you get a join from a Cartesian product. So usually you see it something like A X B and then you're selecting something like A dot X equals B dot X. So A bow tie B is really equal to a selection of from the Cartesian product. Okay. Questions about that? 
set intersection is also can be formed if you have again a and b if you say a minus a minus b that gives you a intersect b so if you take out if you so a minus b gives you everything in a that's not in b so when you subtract that from a that gives you everything common to a and b and I'll let you look up set division. That's a little more complicated. Okay, so you need to know the difference between the convenience operations and the fundamental operations. And I always love this big hint to ask you how to form one of these three convenience operations from one of the relational algebra from the fundamental operations. Okay, so with relational calculus, you only need to know the tuple calculus. We don't need to know the um, other one. And so remember a predicate, a query is a predicate. So it's a truth valued function, and we apply that predicate to every tuple in a relation. When we plug in a tuple, we get what is called a proposition. So a proposition is a predicate filled in with values. That proposition makes the predicate either true or false. In the relational calculus, if the tuple makes the predicate true, the tuple is included in the result. Okay, So we have the concept of a tuple variable, which is a variable that ranges over all tuples in the relation. So we typically say we want all tuples S such that the, any tuple in F, we want any tuple in S that satisfies the predicate, that makes the predicate true. Okay? And in writing our predicates, we're allowed to use any Boolean operation, so any comparison, I'm sorry, Boolean operations are AND, OR, and NOT. We're also allowed to use any relational operations, which are less than, greater than, equal. We are allowed to use the existential quantifier, which is true if there is at least one tuple for which the predicate is true. So that's a bit like OR, because essentially it's saying A, for every tuple in the relation, as long as there's one tuple in the relation that matches it, it's true. The universal quantifier is like AND. It's saying that every tuple must effectively satisfy the predicate. So existential is very forgiving. As long as one satisfies it, it's true. For all is very unforgiving. It is true only if every tuple makes the predicate true. And then we had this notion of free versus bound variables. So a bound variable, a bound tuple variable, so when we talk about variables, we're talking about tuple variables. Bound variables are ones that are bound to an existential or universal quantifier. They are supporting the free variables. The free variables are the ones whose attributes we want to see in the uh, solution. So when we get our setback, they are the tuple variables appearing on the left side. So any tuple variable appearing on the left side of the set, in this case, is free. Any free um, a free variable is one where we are interested in seeing one or more of its attributes in the result. A bound variable is essentially one that is being, to being used to support the query, but we don't care about seeing those tuples in the result. So for example, in a semi-join, if I was semi-joining S and T, actually let's say I was doing a semi-join of A and B, That's a semi-join. 
then a would be the free, actually a would be a free variable in the relational calculus, b would be bound to an existential quantifier. We wouldn't care about b in the result, but we would only include tuples from a that match some tuple in b. So b would be a bound variable supporting the query. Okay, and then you need to be able to map relational calculus to relational algebra and vice versa and relational calc. So we talked about three languages that are data manipulation languages, relational calculus, relational algebra, SQL. You need to be able to go back and forth between any of those three languages. If I give you a question that says, here's a relational algebra query, circle the answer that corresponds to the SQL query, you need to be able to map that relational algebra query to the corresponding SQL query. Or I may say circle the relational calculus query that corresponds to it. Same thing. Okay? This only applies to graduate students, not to undergraduate students. Questions about that? Now we get into stuff that's probably a little more familiar because we covered it in the last few weeks. So with ER di um, diagrams, it's very important that you be able to, given a written description, tell me what are the entities for that case. So I'll give you a um, case study, like in the sample exam, and I'll ask you to give me the entities. And I'll also ask you to give me the relationships. So remember... Entities tend to be nouns, relationships tend to be verbs. And you sometimes, unfortunately, get relationships that sound like nouns because in those situations they're either multi-way, they're multi-degree relations, many to many, or they are three or more way relations. And in that case you have three nouns connected sometimes by a noun or sometimes by a verb, but you just have to be careful. Occasionally a relationship shows up as a noun, but it's usually connecting some other nouns, okay? So generally when there are multiple nouns in a sentence, there's a relationship in there somewhere. Okay, I'm not making you draw ER diagrams for the exam. Okay, uh, let's see. So another important thing for the exam is these multiplicity and degree. So you need to be able to give me the multiplicity of a relationship. So participation is the minimum number of entities in the relationship. Cardinality is the maximum number. You also need to be able to tell me the degree of a relationship, which you simply take the cardinalities of the two multiplicities and put them together. And finally, you need to be able to tell me about fan traps and chasm traps. When they're drawn, um, so I guess I actually do need you to be able to recognize in an ER diagram what a fan trap looks like, what a chasm trap looks like, and how you would fix it in an ER diagram. So I'd give you multiple choice answers, and you would then have to show me which diagram fixed it. Okay, so ER design is a top-down approach to design. Normalization was a bottom-up approach, a mathematical approach. And in order to do normalization, you first have to be able to identify the functional dependencies between the attributes in a relation. So generally you start with a big relation, you identify the functional dependencies. A full functional dependency is one in which you cannot make a smaller, you can't remove any attribute from the determinant and still have that functional dependency whole. A partial functional dependency is a functional dependency in which the determinant is bloated, meaning 
one or more attributes could be removed from the determinant and it would still be a functional dependency. A transitive dependency is where you have A determines B, B determines C. The transitive de dependency here is A determines C. That's a transitive dependency. We don't represent transitive dependencies explicitly. They are implicit. So they are inferred from two other dependencies. Okay, and the determinant is the left side attributes in a functional dependency. So then you need to know what are the important properties of normalization. So the ability to recombine the original relation by using a join without losing information, and the ability to preserve every dependency or constraint. A dependency is a constraint. Every constraint or dependency that is in the original relation needs to be preserved in at least one of the decomposed relations. Then you need to be able to recognize anomalies. Update anomalies are ones that occur when you update a piece of information and because it's redundant you have to make sure you update every piece of information. Now, foreign keys and primary keys cannot be subject to update anomalies. Yes, foreign keys may be redundant, but they are not an update anomaly. You cannot eliminate redundancy associated with foreign keys. So on a test, if one of the cases is, if I change one value of a foreign key, I have to update it everywhere, that's not an update anomaly. So it's only, update anomalies are things we can eliminate using normalization. Insert and delete refers to entities. Insert means we can't insert an entity because some other entity must be present. Delete means if we delete all tuples associated with a entity, we remove all information about that entity. Okay? You need to be able to normalize. You need to be able to take something from first normal form and to convert it to third normal form. Okay? So you use partial dependencies to go from first to second normal form. You move, you use transitive dependencies to go from second to third normal form. And it's based on the primary key. So you need to first know what is the primary key in order to be able to identify what are the partial dependencies on that primary key. A partial dependency is any dependency whose determinant is a subset of the primary key. Yes? A multi-valued attribute. A repeating group is essentially a multi-valued attribute. A repeating group is what you remove when you go from second norm, from zero normal form. Okay, a repeating group is either a multi-valued attribute or multiple tuples. I think they may have meant by repeating group several tuples that were the same, roughly. Um, okay, and then physical design, you need to know the definitions for disks like seek time and rotational latency, you need to obviously be able to insert into a B plus tree. You need to know the performance characteristics. Log, the log M divided by two of N for a B plus tree, the two or three um, disk accesses for extendable hash tables. You need to know when a B plus tree should be used for an index, when an extendable hash table should be used for an index. You need to know the different types of indices. So cluster and primary key indices are good for range queries. Secondary indices are good for point queries. And finally, I guarantee you I will ask you some questions on, I will ask you should this relation be indexed? And then I will say give you a bunch of reasons why it should either be indexed or not indexed, and you need to be able to tell me 
the reason why it should be indexed or why it should not be indexed. So I might say something like in the um, property management relation, one of the questions might be, um, should I place a index on the branch number in the branch relation? And the answer is no. And the reason is the branch relation is too small to be indexed. Okay? You might want to answer yes because it is frequently used in a join. It is a primary key used in a join, but in this case you don't index the branch relation because it's too small. So the answer in this case would actually be no because the branch relation is too small to be indexed. So I will give you several questions like that where I give you a relation, some information about the relation, and I ask you whether the attribute or set of attributes should be indexed, and you will need to tell me why or why not to index it. Okay? So take a look at that. Again, it is there under review notes. If you have questions, post them to Piazza. I will see you next Tuesday.